this is the, the title says neoclassical supply and demand experiments and the classical theory of price formation this is about people finding prices in markets it's not in, you, you know in modern theory what finds prices it's supply and demand it's a very mechanical thing there's no people there are no people in that uh, narrative if you read Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations, Chapter 7, Book 1, it's all about people. It's buyers and sellers who go to market and they find the prices. Terms like supply and demand are used, but uh, in a way to, to just support what people are doing. So that's, that's, that's very important. And I, I couldn't have said that, you see, two years ago, because this is part of kind of the discovery that uh, that Cebu and I have been involved in. All right, so uh, in supply and demand theory, when consumers arrive in markets, how do theorists, and this is modern theorists as well as neoclassical theorists in the 1870s, how do they express their demand? Well, the general equilibrium theorists said that Q, the quantities demanded, were functions of prices, okay? Marshall, if you read uh, uh, Marshall's Principles of Economics, uh, he says that price is a function of the quantity. These were the two different ways we had of expressing demand and almost everyone is was uh, introduced into that world. Well, they're both incorrect. I'll repeat, they're both wrong. Why? <clears throat> well, very simply, pre-market, before you go to market, prices cannot be given. They haven't been found yet. You see, that's the whole point of chapter seven of the, of, of the Wealth of Nations. People find those prices. Buyers and sellers find those prices when they go to market. So the neoclassical and modern error is to state that given prices, individuals maximize utility sub to, subject to a budget constraint yielding optimal quantities as functions of prices. You can't do that because there are no prices yet, okay? The classical economist, and this is Adam Smith in chapter seven of the Wealth of Nations and his French, English, and Italian followers did not make this error, okay? In Adam Smith, the function of markets are simply to do two things. First, aggregate demand because buyers and sellers have all arrived in market and they bring their, uh, their uh, private circumstances with them. And the second thing that happens in that market is that people find prices. And when they find prices, only then can we talk about demand being related to prices. Okay, now that sequence is very, very important. If you don't learn anything else from this lecture, learn that because that's the point. Okay, now how did classical e economy represent agents, that's buyers and sellers in consumer markets. Well, the commodity space was discrete. And imagine now go to the grocery store and what, what's in your market baskets. It's things like a quart of milk, a pound of bacon, a jar of olives, a box of cereal. They're all discrete items. In a few cases, you might buy a second unit, but mostly you're buying one unit of each. And so one unit is the canonical case, okay? So buyers each value a unit of the good. And the value is measured measured by their ma the maximum amount they're willing to pay. That's what we're going to call that WTP. And so, uh, when buyers and and sellers arrive at market, they're, the buyers are bringing bringing values, individual values as a function of the quantities they want, and that's typically just one unit. All right. And sellers each have and have a maximum willingness to pay. Each, sellers each have a minimum willingness to accept, call that WTA. Okay, and that's is cost as a function of quantities. All right, now demand here is non-increasing. That's the or, this is a distribution function. It has nothing to do with diminishing marginal utility. It's it's just the property of a distribution function. And similarly, the sellers are uh, are bringing a distribution of costs, non-decreasing. You see, so Marshall's thinking was right, but his math error was in replacing V and C with price because what people, what buyers bring to market is this maximum willingness to pay, the value. 
and sellers a minimum will have to accept a cost, okay? Prices do not appear in these distribution functions because P price has not yet been found in the market by higgling and bargaining. And that's the point of chapter uh, seven of the Wealth of Nations. Okay, now what's our talk about? We're gonna, I'm gonna briefly go through the role of experiments in discovering the failures of, neoclassical, of the neoclassical marginal utility paradigm to predict experimental economics. What failed was the theory, not the markets. The markets did very well. And secondly, I want to revisit classical value theory. That is the price foundation or the price formation process you see uh, uh, that, that buyers and sellers go through in, in, in finding prices. And then the third thing I want to do is mathematize the content of classical value theory. And don't please don't be terrorized by this. This is easy because all we're going to do is take the words in Adam Smith's chapter seven and we're going to express them mathematically. And believe me, Adam Smith is a very rigorous guy. His thinking is extremely precise and his words are very, very precise. That's why it's really not that difficult to express them mathematically. Okay, now I wanna now talk about uh, how experiments were, uh, we discovered and actually quite unintentionally, I never had any intention of doing this at all, discovered uh, uh, neoclassical, uh, the failures of neoclassical margin utility theory. And very briefly, what, what did the early experiments involve? Well, they involved small numbers. Okay, we had, uh, you know, uh, a dozen to two dozen buyers and sellers, and that would, would have been considered very small. Each sub was assigned one unit, maybe in some cases, a two or three, but mostly in those early experiments, they had one unit. We used the double oral auction, uh, a multilateral open outcry, uh, institutional process or trading rule process uh, to discover prices. All right, prices, or, uh, all value and cost was completely decentralized. That was private to the individual. There was no public information except as people would voluntarily uh, reveal it. All right, and in the bids and asks or their acceptance of, of bids and asks as they, as they appeared in the market. The subjects were utterly naive in economics. They were, uh, it was the first day of a principal's classes before they had had an opportunity to be contaminated by any reading in economics. So we're getting them naive, all right. Well, so what happens in those markets? Well, quite shockingly, they converged to approximate the supply and demand clearing price. It was a point or set of points predefined by the experiments. I defined those in advance and, and, made, and didn't make any changes of the, in those. Uh, when the participants started to trade. All of that was so. And the whole point is that mid 20th century economic theory was completely unprepared for these results. Uh, okay, here's the, there were four sources of inspiration in those first experiments. First, Jevons, William Stanley Jevons, the English writer had, uh, had provided the background. He maximized individual utility functions given prices and income. Uh, but the first implementation you see in experiments was for discrete, with this, this discrete unit. You see now, about a decade later, I wrote a paper uh, in 1976, it was published in the American Economic Review that was primarily a methodological reconstruction you see, of, of what I thought I had done. Well, you know what, if I am, so, I, I need to revisit that paper and completely rewrite it because there's a lot of things in that paper that were, uh, that were I, I would now say were just simply wrong. They express what it is, what I believe and what people generally in the profession believe, but that didn't make it right, okay? Uh, and then secondly, the context of those experiments were very much out of Marshall because it, it, what I did was to operationalize the notion that, that supply involves a flow of goods onto the market and demand involves a disappearance of those goods from the market. So that's a very, very important uh, contribution that Marshall made. It, it's in Adam Smith's uh, uh, chapter seven, but the point is uh, he, Marshall, uh, we should be very grateful for him to, in emphasizing that. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, and then we, what I got from Chamberlain's first experiments is that he had pioneer, pioneered in this willingness to pay, willing, willingness to accept reservation price procedures, what he called the tickets, okay, that represented Marshall's demand or supply price. He brought that in, and that was an, uh, and, and I built on that. It, it was also in Menger, Menger and Bob Bauer, but I didn't read that until much later, and at least in a way that I understood how it related to experiments. And then finally, uh, prices just formed endogenously and spontaneously among the participants. Okay. Now I use this oral outcry uh, double auction procedure. That wasn't part of economics. I got there's an old finance book by uh, Leffler, 1951, that describes trading in the Chicago and New York stock exchange market, and uh, and that's the way I implemented the market. And we discovered con convergence toward a law of one price, okay, that came out of that. And I'm going to go to that now. Here's my first experiment. Did this in January 1956. That's what, about 75 years ago. Uh, all right. Now, uh, notice here on the left hand diagram, I have the price on the vertical axis. That's wrong. You see, I, I was perpetuating this error. There are no prices on that vertical axis, only values and costs, the values of the buyers and the, and the costs of the sellers. And these are discrete. It individual, each person has just one unit, you see, in that representation. Now, the right-hand diagram, there are prices there, but they're the ones that are coming out of the market. These are the prices being discovered in the market. Now, those results rather shocked me because I have no expectation that these naive sophomores would just get right into it and immediately discover prices so close to the market clearing. And, and in fact, I thought it was, there, was, there was something wrong with the experiment. And I thought the thing that was wrong with the experiment is there's too much symmetry here. Look at the diagram on the left. The average uh, value of buyers the average cost of the sellers are all equal to the equilibrium price. So I thought it was an artifact of that symmetry. And so very soon thereafter, I did an asymmetric case, which I thought would destroy that result. But it didn't. It not only didn't destroy it, it convert this this market is also converging in about three iterations. It's coming into the equilibrium, you see, uh, very quickly. So this is when I began to realize that in the laboratory, I had a way of testing what it is I thought I knew. And I thought I knew that there was too much symmetry in that first experiment. So here I'm doing one and I, I find I've got a way of, of falsifying my own beliefs if they're wrong. So that, that really got me hooked. And that's why I kept stayed in the business of doing experiments is because of those rather shocking results. All right, now here is a much more uh, recent experiment. These are high school students. This is part of a teaching exercise. And uh, there are six buyers and six sellers in this market. They each have uh, an, an endowments of up to four units that they might uh, trade. In the upper right-hand corner, there are the columns. You are seeing uh, the buyers and sellers that are matched up in producing a, an agreed upon price. And also in this market, you will see the blues are bids by buyers. The red is, is are asked by sellers. So as in this open cry oral process, an assistant is typing these values, these uh, bids and asks into a computer, and they're being displayed on this screen for the for the six buyers and sellers to see as they trade. So they're seeing the results that they wrought in this in this market, okay? And because this is a teaching exercise with these students, we then, after they finish, we display the the demand and supply operant in that market, as reflected, you see, in the aggregation of all of their values and costs, which none of them were privy to that. They, each person only knows their own private segment of that total demand or supply. So that's, you see, this is the kind of teaching exercise that now has been replicated probably tens of thousands of times. And because people now regularly use these, this 
supply and demand, open outcry exercise to demonstrate uh, uh, economic theory. Okay, now what, but what was the convergence mechanism in these early experiments? Well, I, I examined the data and I was looking at excess demand because you see Boras and all, everyone in economics at that time saw the driver of convergence as the excess demand. So if, if prices are below equilibrium, you, you have an excess demand and the price goes up. If, it, if it's above, then you have an excess demand is negative and prices tend to fall. Well, I was didn't find that, that didn't, wasn't explaining the prices. What was explaining much better is what I call excess rent. And here's a diagram out of that original 1962 uh, paper, you see, and take the area under the demand curve and above the supply curve at any arbitrary price. Here, here it is, it's a price below equilibrium. Well, the distance at that price between demand and supply is the, is the excess demand. The, but I found a much more closely real related predictor as the area you see shown here as what I called excess ram. All right, I think of it as the amount of money that if that price doesn't move, okay? Now I asked, how can I be, come up with a supply and the demand that can more specifically test this Valrasian hypothesis against what I have called here the excess rent hypothesis? Well, I came up with this weird supply and demand because you see it has the property that the uh, at any price, the difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded is always constant. So the pressure to change prices never changes. It's always constant. Whereas the excess rate rent says that it, that pressure tends to decline exponentially. You see, as that area gets smaller, you see you'll get smaller and smaller effect. Okay, well, now here's some results with various amounts of excess supply to five and eight. And so, in fact, generally, these are tending to decay exponentially, not linearly. So th this became the, uh, and this was in my, my uh, third paper that I published was in the, also in the JPE 1965. So I was sort of playing out in the first experiments that followed the 1962 paper, I was kind of exploring in, in depth, in depth, some of the findings that emerged in that paper. Okay, now here's a summary of the neoclassical economics. Jevons and Slobo had no theory of market price discovery. They had only this maximum utility theory of quantity choice of given prices. They imposed the law of one price. See, that meant they imposed price-taking behavior and the law of one price in a market on what individuals would discover in markets. Well, you know, so they had they had no discovered by people in the market. So and, and so what was Jemin's idea about how you might actually get those equilibrium prices? Well he said you had to have complete perfect information. This is the only way on his model. You had to have complete information on his model, then you could find the prices. Well that's what that tells you nothing about what the people do in the market, you see. And we'll all imagine the next exogenous agents, you see. And he found those prices by trial and error. And once he found them, why then, then everyone knew them. And this, this, by the way, led naturally to a famous debate. The socialist economist, Baroni in Italy, Longa, uh, Longi, Longa was a well-known uh, Polish economist of those days. And, and he was a socialist economist and also Abelarna in England. So there was international re a representation here from the socialist economists, and they all have one simple argument, and that is the state can set these prices. Just the, the state can be that agent who tries out prices and finds the equilibrium. Okay, well, <clears throat> also, if you go to Marshall, Menger, and Bombard and read what they say about price discovery. They're, they say nothing about marginal utility. They make no, they were champions of utility theory. When it came to talking about price discovery in markets, they made no use of that. 
what did they use? They used the framework of willingness to pay and willingness to accept reservation prices. <clears throat> and moreover, what they did was essentially elaborate uh, chapter seven of the Wealth of Nations. Okay, now what is classical economics? <clears throat> well, goods have value and use. That's what you find in Adam Smith, and they have that, and that's demand. They have value and exchange, and that's price. Uh, value in use is measured by uh, this, these reservation prices, what Adam Smith called effectual demand, are these reservation prices, these willingnesses to pay. It's not clear that it was the maximum willingness to play in Adam Smith, and the French, the French followers of Adam Smith clarified that fairly quickly already by, oh, you know, by 1800. Uh, they were 25 years after Adam Smith had written, uh, they were clarifying things like that. Hmm. And also, and, and this was correct in, and carried on by the, the followers, in, in Adam Smith, value and exchange depends upon competition and entry, okay? It, it's, uh, because, it's because there's no entry by producers that the demand price is determined is the monopoly price. You see, there's no entry against that because there's only one source of diamonds, the African uh, uh, diamond mines. And, and that's why prices are uh, fail to adjust. On the other hand, iron or water prices, those are low because you have an entry of, of, of producers uh, into that market. <clears throat> okay, and then here on page 73 and 74 of the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith gives you the, his whole theory of, of price formation. He says, the quant if the quantity brought to market falls short of effectual demand, those willing to pay the supply price cannot be supplied. Some will bid for what they can get and price will increase. So in other words, he says, if price it starts out too low, it will increase. And moreover, you see, he says that sales is limited by supply. People can't buy more than sellers offer. And then on the other hand, if the quality brought to market exceeds demand, so now <clears throat> uh, price is too high, uh, it cannot all be sold by buyers willing to pay the supply price and price falls. So sales is limited by, price not only falls, but sales is limited by demand. People can sell more than buyers are willing to buy. And that's it. That's the whole of the theory right there. So his theory is first, that price change has the same sign as excess demand. And now we can state that easily mathematically. And second, at any price, contracted quantity is limited by the minimum of amount demanded or supplied. So that's the extent of mathematical uh, restrictions on the market. Okay, here, and so now here's the mathematical theory. And, and remember here, the motivation by buyers and sellers based upon maximum willingness to pay and minimum willingness to accept. They come to market and the buyers wanna buy cheap and the sellers wanna sell dear. Okay, that's the motivation. Uh, price adjustment is dynamic. You see, price change and excess demand, ex call that E of P, have the same sign. So we can re write that mathematically. E of P times the change in price with respect to transactions, T here is transactions, not time. It might map into time, but we're specifically thinking about transactions, particularly in the experiment. Uh, if, if <clears throat> and so that's strictly positive. If, uh, if price, uh, if, if the excess supply is not equal to zero, that is if we don't have now a stationary condition in the market. And now we define V of P. See, that's the, that original V of P that I had back in, in, in uh, 1962, but didn't really understand, you see, the full implications of that. My, my, my co-author, uh, uh, Saviu, taught me that, you see, because he had that idea when he first contacted me uh, some, what, something over two years ago. Uh, so V of P here is the integral of excess supply, okay? And it's the profit, you see, required to sustain a price. In, in, in the market, it, it defines that profit, and that may be not sustainable, but it, it, it would be it, it would be what it would take to do it. Okay, so um, and notice here that the change in this integral, this this uh, uh, 
capital G function with respect to transactions is never positive. Okay, so it's always tending to, to diminish. Okay, so for discrete, discrete values and costs, what is V of P? Well, it's just the distance on the buyer side between a buyer's values and the price. And we're summing over, they never, we summar, summarize only on the, over those values that are greater than price because they don't, they don't go to market to lose money. And we sum over the costs that are below the price because sellers go to market to, to edit their purchases so that they make money. Or equivalently, we can write V of P, you see, as that function uh, there in the middle of the page. So notice here that V is the overall weighted distance between price and the trader's valuation. So it's namely, it's, it's their reservation, mm. uh, reservation, mm. it, it, the price value distance. So it's a, it's a distance in process. And, and profit space and that and profit space of course is where the action is and so v of p is directly directly measuring that and then we also have short side rationing in adam smith that people can't trade more than the minimum of the amount supplied or demanded so it's min of the sp v of p so and then what's the total surplus well that's the to total surplus is the profit realized realizable at the market price and that has to take into account short side ration. And so those are the, all of the mathematical principles that are involved here. And we end up with what Sabu and I call the principle of, <clears throat> of, of uh, maximum information. <clears throat> and then here is a representation, here's the basic theorem. You assume a competitive market and, that, and in the classical sense that, that means entry. Entry is free. There's no impediments to entry. And we assume that no retrading takes place. See, because that brings in speculation. That's asset prices that you can do that. In consumer markets, people are only buying uh, to eat what they can uh, buy. And, and, and sellers are selling that at a profit uh, that they realize that, that that's, and there's no retrading. People are not, consumers are not going in the market to buy haircuts hotel rooms, uh, airplane passenger seats in order to resell them. They're buying them to consume them. That's a really important principle in everything we're talking about. There is no retrading of anything. Okay, so now what we've plotted here on the diagram, uh, here the upper diagram on the left, you see is this, <clears throat> there's the demand and supply functions and we can't can't trade more than is either uh, on the demand schedule or on the supply schedule. Okay, at any price, uh, say they're uh, uh, below the equilibrium, you see we have uh, <clears throat> either, uh, we have these, I'm sorry, price below equilibrium, uh, the trading quantity is limited by demand and above, uh, I mean supply and above is limited by, by demand. And up here on, on the right, that U-shaped function on the top, that's that V of P function, okay? And the function below is the, the surplus actually realized by the buyers and sellers, you see? And that's that's uh, truncated uh, for, at prices below or above equilibrium. It's, it's, it's at its maximum only at, at that market clearing of price. And over across transactions, you have a steady decay, no matter where the market begins, and, and notice this is this is non-parametric. This model from Adam Smith chapter seven has no parameters in it. It doesn't tell you how fast things happen. It just tells you qualitatively what happened. Okay, now one last point. There's no saving in this. So people are consuming, which means that wealth is being eaten up. So let's get saving in it. How do we get saving? Well. Guess what? You go to Adam Smith's first book. We've been talking about his second. Let's go to his first book. There he models uh, assets uh, in, in classical style. Uh, he, he, he tells us what savings is. And he says that the security motivation for security saving, you see, is a direct corollary of a fundamental asymmetry between potential, potential gain and potential, uh, potential loss. And he says that very articulately 
on page 213, and he also discusses it earlier on page 45. And what does he say? He says, we suffer more when we fall from a better to a worse situation than we ever enjoy when we rise from a worse to a better. Security, therefore, is the first and the principal object of prudence. It is adverse to expose our health, our fortune, our rank, or reputation to any sort of hazard. Well, this gives you a, a model of savings. Because suppose that we have corn. We're producing corn. Imagine that's the only product. We can either eat it or we can store it. Okay, suppose we let small x be the amount that we eat, and let's let capital X be the amount that we store. Well, that's consumption and it's savings, and that's an asset, okay? It might be held in cash, it might be held in securities, you know, there's a lot of different forms, but it's simply, it, it's, it represents stored corn, okay? All of the asset holdings in the world are potential consumption that you can convert that into, cons if we had several years of bad harvest, you could cons convert those stocks into consumption, okay? Suppose now we have small WTP prime of X being the willingness to pay for consumption, capital WTP of cap X as the amount we're willingness to pay for stored corn. Then we have small X and capital X as defining our, our world. We need production, let that be X prime. That's produced corn. And, and that's, in, that's how that's in supply. So what we have here, is whoops. What we have here on uh, at the bottom of this slide is we can write an equation. We can say that the price of the asset times the quantity of it that we end the period with is the price times the amount quantity we started with plus in our income that we've earned minus the consumption. Okay, so that's exhaust. Uh, what's happening in that world. And okay, so now we can chart that. And believe me, now any sophomore, this is great for teaching and your principles of economics, any sophomore can, can, can get this. On the left, we have, a, the, we have scheduled here the willingness to pay demand for corn stored, okay, for saving. And that's declining. And we have an inelastic supply. And we begin the period with X not units of an asset. We end with a, an increase in this representation uh, and call that the equilibrium cap X star. And the price of that, and, and in this diagram, I've made the price of the asset equal to the, namely corn stored, equal to the price of corn eaten, okay? consumption. In other words, there's no, there's no cost to storing the corn. Think of it that way. Okay, making those equal. And over on the right, we have the willingness to pay demand for consumed corn and the willingness to accept supply of produced corn. Now, in equilibrium, the difference between amount produced and amount consumed is simply a, a savings. Okay, it's our income minus our consumption. Re in real value, it's I over P income. So, okay, now isn't, tell me now, isn't that pretty simple and straightforward? Here's the summary and I'm gonna stop now and leave this slide up and go to, and go to the questions. You see, the experiments tell you nothing about reducibility out there in the world, okay? What we do in the laboratory is we're able to do much more precise tests of our model of how the world works. The next job is to ask how that affects what we observe out there in the world. Now that, that takes, that would take field experiments. You see experiments out there in the world uh, to, to really examine those questions. And that's why Experimentalists from the very beginning, uh, back in the uh, 1960s and 70s, were all, all of us were interested in field experiments as well as laboratory experiments. And 
uh, starting in 1984, 85, I was involved in uh, the alternatives to regulation in the state of Arizona. We had a project involving uh, the uh, communications, uh, electric power, and natural gas markets, which were the main regu regulated uh, industries. And, <clears throat> and that, that exercise led us to start doing experiments in, and we got funded from, uh, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to do studies applying this stuff to natural gas markets. Later, we got funding to apply it to electric power markets. And uh, if you fast forward up to the early 1990s, I was invited, and invited first to New Zealand uh, and stayed in Wellington, uh, New Zealand, uh, and worked with uh, the New Zealand uh, Treasury on the application of this stuff to electric power markets. And, and we, we worked on creating a, uh, a and, and we used the experiments to demonstrate in the laboratory, you see this feasibility. The next step was to do experiments in which the environment was drawn directly from the field. We did, we started that exercise in New Zealand, but my colleague, Stephen Lucente, who was a systems engineer, and I went to Australia in, the, in 1993, 90, yeah, I think it was 1993, 1994, and worked on the implementation of this in the, the, uh, the Australia's National Grid Management Council. You see, they were interested in, in uh, creating markets in electric power to substitute for for state regul regulation. And I don't need to go into all the sources of, of that pressure, but people were pretty unhappy with uh, what the state governments were doing through their ownership of the electric power industry. And, and the first thing we did was put the practitioners into markets, our laboratory markets, and then the Australians took it over and they said, we want to create a laboratory market which has our grid environment specifically in the experiment. And so they created a market where buyers and sellers in the laboratory were trading electric power on a representation of the Australian grid. Well, you can't get any closer to the real world than that. In fact, if you were trading in that experiment and trading out in the real world, you wouldn't know the difference because it was exactly the same. So, so you see, you get from the laboratory to the field by some process which is looking at what the real world out there. Well, I can tell you that the Australian, what the Australians did was uh, hire uh, people that were computer savvy to trade electric power in a laboratory representation of their grid. And they had them trade for two weeks and they pay them uh, substantial sums of money to trade. The point is the people that were gonna move this into the real world were perfectly happy with what these motivated uh, individuals would do in the laboratory. And they moved it in and they moved that into the field. And the Australians were so taken by the success of all of this that they now auction everything, water, green power, you see, to, to uh, if, if they want to auction uh, 100 megawatts of supply from green sources, they make you uh, bid to supply that. And as a result, they get the efficient uh, number of individuals to do that. So, you know, they, they address environmental questions using markets to do this. And they, and they create markets for water, you see. And, uh, very successful and, and and one of the reasons why all that worked is they didn't have a state regulatory system like we have in the United States. Those industries were owned by government entities and 
those government entities were losing money. The treasuries were hurting and the governments and the people wanted to do something about it and they moved to do it, something about it. We're hung up on that. We're not doing that in the United States because we have uh, not one regulator, but 50. Every state has its own regulatory apparatus and it's, it's a, a nightmare. You see, it's, uh, uh, and there's all kinds of special interests built up around that regulatory system. Believe me, the regulated utilities like it. They love it. They don't want to change it and they will not support changing it because it's exactly what they want. And let this be a warning, you see, to governments everywhere that this is the kind of lock-in that you can get. <laughs>